So this is amazing. This is the first time that it happens. You got the power, right? Yes, I have the power. I should like to thank, first of all, the organizing committee for their kind of invitation for trusting us with this presentation. I should like you to give an applause to all those people who are working here for you. You, don't, you didn't even picture how many people are out there making sure that everything goes right. So an applause for the whole organization. Thank you for making it possible. Thank you all for making it possible. And we're here. Well, I've been told, give a presentation for those people who are not of a technical profile. And so yesterday and today we've heard highly technical presentations. I'm a criminal lawyer, an expert in cyber um, security. I'm a bit more close to earth, but I get the support of technicians all the time. So I'll try to explain uh, quite some problems I often come across so that everyone can understand this. So we are ready now. So two slides ahead of yourself. Now you go first. Okay. So who are you? I'm Jose Aurelio Garcia. I'm a computer auditor. And I help Ruth in those messes she gets me into. I'm an IT scientist, especially I work on computer forensics. Um, you've heard about uh, hacking and computing, but I'm much more onto auditing, finding out what happens after someone has broken into something. And once I find it out, I give it to Ruth and Red prosecutes them. That's what I do. I'm a criminal law, as a, a lawyer, as I said. I work on well, we lawyers, we've been trained to play the game on the side who's paying us. So whether they're good people or villains, that's up to the judge. And so we have the skills to defend in the misunderstood hacker. That could be a cracker more than a hacker, vulnerating uh, some limits or boundaries or defending the company, the person who's been a victim of attacks on their reputation, um, financial information, data, etc. So I would also like to to say hello to those who are on stream, and especially Yolanda Corral, because she's great with what uh, he does at Palabra de Hacker. And this nose goes to Mary Peak, because yesterday I saw this tweet and I saw the clip were the uh, colleagues from Alarmiguero where I, I have so much fun was watching their, their TV show and they would say, I'm a hacker. And Soren, who was here yesterday, said, you know, I get so bored, hacker, and explaining that we are no criminal. We are no criminals. And so when you see the clip where you say that we are hacking the Pentagon, so funny. Yeah, it's funny and it is not, because if you think of yourself as a hacker, as a researcher, that's not the discourse they understand being naughty, pushing the limits all the way to crime. So that's kind of a reflection I would like to share. They would say we get bored having to explain over and over uh, this explanation, uh, but it's necessary. We are no criminals. Uh, a hacker is no criminal. He is just a researcher with curiosity. What's the greatest engine for learning? That's curiosity. What happens with curiosity is that often it takes us to places that might be out of sight. Now, at Christmas, I like to go to those houses with the curtains open and drive on my bike and say, oh, this is beautiful, this is nicely decorated, or else, what are they doing in there? Having dinner, or maybe at summer, ground floor, and they are out there, and you see, she's wearing a bikini, and he's doing whatever. But do we go in or not? We don't. And an IT system, a computer system, there is that double layer as well. I drive around the, or along the street and I see this company 
And out of curiosity, what do I do? The question is, do I get in? Uh, let's see what's the settings uh, for the website. Let's see if I can have access. Let's see if I can have access over there. So the door may be open, same as in summertime. And some people do actually go in. And even if you've just patrolled into a company, you are already in their security system. And what do I find? What do I find? There are some anonymous calls or tweets on DM saying, I got into X place. I found X things. Please report it to the law enforcement officers. But why should I do it? Because I know nothing about ones and zeros, and you are protected my, by uh, client professional uh, privilege. And I'd rather you do it through through me. But there are other forms to let the attack centers, the attack warning centers uh, know. But if you are cyber patrolling, if you're sniffing around and going unintentionally, and you made no use of it, so do not use a lawyer for your communications, for warning. Many people do it. They patrol. None in this room, I'm sure. That's what I call uh, staking out or, or patrolling. And they keep the vulnerabilities to themselves so that they can exploit them. They can sell them out. They tend to take credentials. They have access to unlimited amounts of information. They bribe and blackmail business people. And they use it for industrial spionage as well. So please. A hacker is no criminal. I need to have a t-shirt printed next time. It, they are researchers. And I have to say, I have to say that I went, I go to cops, to police academies, because cyber patrolling means that sometimes we might go over the, b the boundaries and we need to know how to clean the information. I found this, I have to take a step back and make it look good. So th that's still there. But please, Mr. Judge, Mrs. Judge, go there and check it out. My recommendation would be, I, I got so many reports to the law enforcement officers and entities and companies. And I thought, how can I solve it? Let, let's show what hacking is, what's intruding into IT systems, but in a controlled way, consented and agreed upon together with the victim. And with Jose Aurelio, we came up with a project as presentation. So let's get a virtual machine and let's challenge them to get inside and see if you could get the admin privileges for the website, they had to send us an email back. No one made it. No one made it. This was a project that was ready for Euskal Encounter 2015. And four days before the presentation, I gave we gave them an open door so that they could break into our virtual machine. So let's explain what ethical hacking means. So this is a company that is willing to know where the black holes are. And they contact a professional. There is a contract stating clearly what is to be done. It is a controlled attack where vulnerabilities of the system are to be found and find out the ones that could be exploited by third parties. So you need to be a cracker with permission. No risk should come to the system or there is no, no compromise of the system. So. It, if you like hacking, no need to compromise your company because they are your client. What are the minimum conditions to experience around? There are students, there are kids out there, 11, 12 years old, mingling around. That's the time. That's the time. You are here to get the information. Hacking, researching, that's good. 
but under control. You need to have a hacking lab or have a virtual machine app or a virtual environment app, which is now not real. So what do we find when we are asked to hack? Well, we start with an agreement, there is consent, and the whole company need to be, need to, needs to be aware once we've got the outcomes, the results of how security, if security will be mandatory from the desktop, this from officer saying, okay, like, I have, this is my plane ticket, would you print it for me in a minute? And the, you're such a, so it is that these uh, receptionists would say, yes, perfect. And there you've got the virus in. And it's so easy, it's so easy to get inside a company. So what is in the agreement? Agreement with a company that is willing to have their system broken. The boundary to how far into someone's kitchen are you going in? You will only have limited time. I will not hack them for two years. What the terms and conditions are, very clear. You should never bypass or skip a, even a comma, first because of traces. Because if you go too far, if you keep something for yourself, I might be the lawyer to that company. And then I ask Aurelio, Aurelio, please come and do reverse engineering here and forensic, reverse forensics. Let's pull the thread and see how far we go and who we can find. There are methods based on the type of work you will be conducting. There's one highly standardized, all Oh, WASP, I guess you, you, you know it. This is for software vulnerability detection. OSSTMM, that's, what, what was this for? It's, it's, it's information systems, right? So different systems, to check different systems. And then wireless questions where vulnerabilities are. As part of these parameters on how to hack some into something, there is kind of a science, science and methodology to check the uh, security and processes, communications, internet, wireless security, and physical security and safety at a company. And here's my guy. So, Ruth explained what was a bit more theoretical, legally wise, uh, everything having to do with intrusion into a company security. Have you heard hacker, cracker? So hacker, you all know that word, right? Everyone knows what a hacker is. But maybe we do not all know what the right definition for hacker is. And so we need to go to the Spanish Academy where hacker is defined with um, computer pirate. Those of us who have gray hairs, there's this term, cracker, that's been on for years now. And this was an, a security expert, someone who had that curiosity, not limiting themselves to finding out where fails and vulnerabilities were, but they were also crashing systems. Years ago, well, years ago means 10 years ago for computer science, and years ago, crackers would do it all for their glory and honor. And now they do it for money, in exchange for money, as, as simple as that. There are some stages that are quite common, uh, common for both disciplines, crackers and hackers. So, action steps. First, it's uh, finding information on Google Docs. So, uh, fulliness in, on Google. You need to find things always aimed at an attack. You have social engineering. Then, it's all done on Facebook. Uh, maybe this is not that common anymore because we got this digital education now, but we used to post, I'm leaving for Sepulveda tomorrow and I'm going off to buy a car. Uh, that social engineering that people were using on us, against us. And that's why most people say don't post too much on the internet. A bit more serial attack would be port scanning. Port 21, well, I will explain it in a minute. FTP 22, port 80 for internet, 443, secure port. Looking for known vulnerabilities. Ruth mentioned it. 
wasp and everything oh wasp and everything else there is uh, some websites where they say what the vulnerabilities of some environments are probably most of you you know joomla or wordpress where many websites are produced and uh, th for those vulnerabilities there are people people looking into those vulnerabilities for those massive information management environments and let's say that it's version 3.2 for Joomla and they find there's a vulnerability for SQL attacks and then everyone who has that version if it's not properly secured will have that very vulnerability so go picture how many websites all over the world that have all those vulnerabilities some of which are very important sites network monitoring man in the middle as it is known if i can be in between the source and the destination and a sniff for the information sniff out all the traffic all the information on the network i will get the user keys that's what we always want the admin passwords the network is scanned and that's when the attack starts we find specific vulnerabilities um, such as sql injections and as always the idea is to increase privileges to go in with a new user that has admin privileges or make sure that the standard user through a fail becomes an admin user to the machine so it i own the machine then access gathering attacks tend to be through vote brute force so it's all about finding passwords. You probably know that routine passwords. And we have Frank with us here, who recently gave a wonderful presentation on routers and weaknesses in the routers at home. Users that are one, two, three, four, that's the username and that's the password as well. How many people in the room? Please, hands up. Your router that is Telefonica's or whatever companies. And it is set up just as, as, as it was set up um, originally and has not changed it. Hands up. I guess many more people in this room has not have not changed it, but don't want to raise their hands. These are the easiest to hack into because there are even databases with all the passwords to those routers and to those companies. Once they've got all that information, what do they do? They they crash the machine. They crack into. They take over the admin privileges, and they can do either two things. Uh, they take control of the machine to infect other machines. Many of the websites we connect, we log into, could be totally legit, and yet they've been cracked. They've had a code injected, a PHP side or Uniframe size. It's a small window, and it's malicious code. And the minute I log into that website, which on paper should be fully legit, as it happens, it will infect me my, my machine if my computer is not protected. I said before, or referred before to the cracker stages, and I said one of the things that are necessary is the social engineering, which means finding out things about their victim to attack on them. I need to know things about them, uh, preferences, needs, to attack them on their weak spot. And, and this is a real case I wanted to share here. And it was sent to me. I'm, I'm no hacker. I'm a forensic expert. And I was written to help someone to hack into someone else's account. And this is so useful. Chema Alonso, you probably know him. So he's so used to getting these kind of requests. And here. So someone sends me lots of information with the email accounts because what they want is this one is a jealousy attack and they want to have access to the partner's account to find out what's going on. And this is so very illegal. So it's not just that. Go far, they go farther and they say, I've got the data, I got, I got the pictures, and still sends me specific information about the other person. 
And there's this one thing. And here, here it is. And they say, if you if you cannot do it, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, but I've given you all the information so that you gather it for me. Of course, I paid no attention on paper. So, stages for a hacker. I explained what a cracker does. It, it would be a person, boy, girl, or company doing something just to crush, take down the website. A hacker would be similar to a cracker, but as Ruth said, Ruth said before, there are two ways to behave. Either out of curiosity, they are just looking into sites, and when they spot bugs, they call the company and warns them there is this mistake or this this bug. The company, in reply, could hire them to solve the bug or just sue them because they got in without permission, and that's a crime. Difference, the main difference between hacker and cracker, is that hacker breaks nothing down. That's that's paramount. Then we can consider whether it's legal or not, that's up to Ruth. So, a hacker is, is not a computer pirate, right? That is something that we need to dwell on and explain to other people. Let's see what other kinds of ethical hacking, so that's hacking that's been consented to, to which uh, Companies have given their permission. We have white, grey and black. Do, do you know which each one is? Means, if you don't know it, let me explain it. A white ha ha hacker uses el every knowledge in an ethical way, never going beyond what they've been requested, never beyond that. A grey hat hacker, they have the knowledge they would never break anything down, but they become judges. Oh, we give no names, but if there is an association attacking on uh, or brutalizing animals, there is this group of hackers saying, I'm taking down your website. We are crossing a border there. They on paper do nothing, but they think for some reasons, specific reasons, you should ask, uh, act. No names, although we all know who I refer to. And then Black Hat, the ones that look, well, they are crackers, ra rather. They used to break things down for their glory, for their merit, so you gain recognition within the community. The red virus, red coat virus, um, so it brought so much fame to the author, well, and prescient sentence as well, but now they are just plain cyber criminals. They do it for money. Most common intrusion types, social engineering, increasing privileges, vulnerabilities, exploits. Oh, we are running so late, right? No, we are doing right on time. We also have uh, reverse engineering, brute forcing. Reverse engineering means I have an app and I m want to attack on an app to take down the keys. Probably you know that Office can be uh, copied and you can have pirate copies of Windows 7, you change the password. This is all reverse engineering. I will change the app into source code. I'll see what what are the spots where the user passwords are requested or where the app is moved on and I bypass it or I build up a whole app to bypass it. That would be reverse engineering. We know types of hackers now, and based on that, there are different ways to behave. We can have the white box, mm, probably you've heard about that. That's when a hacker, a computer professional, knows how the app works just perfectly fine. And as they know how it works, they know what all the parameters are. We have a great box. That's where, that's when only part of the app is known. Some things are known, some others 
aren't. And then if you know nothing about the application and you go in blindly, I just want to find bugs to see how far I get and I know nothing about it, that's black box. Bugs. For printing, do you know what it is? Without reading it on the screen, of course. That would be the first step, step towards getting information out through open source intelligence techniques, finding information on social media, on the internet, getting all public information. And that's fully legal. That can be done, no problem. You can find information on the uh, network, on, on, on the website. Sorry, and you go to who is this is fully legal and gets information on an IP address, everything else. You can have DNS calls. You know, there's been quite an attack on DNS addresses, and they uh, I think they crushed uh, half Twitter and other accounts in the US. You can have port scanning with Nmap. They look into every port until they find vulnerabilities there. And then, after all this work is done, what do we do? We produce an audit report, a report that is this thick. We take it to the company and we say, through OSINT techniques, by putting your your application into the gray box, because I don't know it all, I, we found these all these bugs, all the solutions come together as well, come in on the report, and then the CEO sits the the, the, the pile of, of documents and says, oh, thank you very much. Uh, we will do it some, 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 some time in the future. What I like the most of working as a researcher, well, as a researching lawyer, because law is different now. The lawyer is not just behind the desk waiting for customers to come in and trying to understand how it all works. Now, what we need to do is f find out how information can be sniffed out of a Wi-Fi, what operating systems had what vulnerabilities and when. So the lawyer's roles changed. In turn, that means that I am out there patrolling using anonymous profiles because I don't want to be identified. It makes sense. And so that brought me to understanding what the criminal is like. So, the criminal, the offender, what are they like? And what crooks are defined by is the need to share that information, that they've broken into something. They need to tell it. And you need to be patient. But first, don't you think you won't be fine? found? I know that someone will be kissing and telling. That's all about their ego. It's such a challenge breaking into things that I, there's an urge to share it. And at different fora, you have just hints. And you just need to be patient and finding it out. What, what, what can happen? What could happen to you? So according to law, what could happen to you? Intrusions out of curiosity. If you know there's a bug there, a hole there, it's because you've been there. And if you've been there, keep it to yourself or or tell it to someone that will uh, have no problem sharing it. According to this article from the Criminal Code in 2015, it states what, what security measures when it was open. Doesn't matter. It's a place where you should not be going into. And you've not been hired for that, you've been not authorized, and yet you parched or made other people gives access to other people. Other people say, well, please go in for me. Or you hold it against the owner's will. That's when you add up months and years of a prison sentence. If it's the first time around, maybe it is suspended. So s revealing secrets. So you found it, maybe you got information, and maybe you've kept it kept it for yourself. Or you might be using technical uh, tapping or machine to machine, man in the middle techniques. That way you gather information, you uh, record it, you broadcast it. That is one to four year prison centers and fine 12 to 14. 
24 months. It's not just paying money. Sometimes you get a, a fine sentence, but if you don't have the money, but two days that you do not pay, you spend a night in prison. It makes no no fun. It makes no, it's not fun, right? Maybe it is for you. So it's been 60 years, right? So article B is, if you intercept non-public information of uh, transmission, sorry, of, inf of IT data. So now we add up to eight years because it's two year sentence, this article. This is for you. It's everything that Ruth was saying about how you could continue summing up, adding things. This is a perfect attack carried out through RP spoofing, as it says on the screen. You can see it there. So an IP address is being attacked. This is a local one. And a number of data is being exfiltrated through the ALS attacks. That is to say, in this case, email, uh, account, and the a key. So this is illegal. I cannot extract any uh, key if someone well gives me the key password. Okay, it's okay if they give it to me. So, for instance, now we are dealing with a case, handling a case, a social media. So a person that had the social media accounts hijacked, and we are working to recover that social media. We have the person's passwords, but we have the consent of that person, the agreement of the person to use the password. Actually, well, to be honest, we don't read all that information that it says there. And this is the easiest part in terms of viewing. So we have this all hexadecimal, and this is the part that we are getting. This is what we are getting this time. So if I'm not mistaken, this is a virtual machine. This is where we are working. This is the email account. And this is where we are just uh, getting all well, data from that email account. And this that I'm showing you now is what we said before about real attacks. The, actually, this is an actual attack. It is from the 1st of December this year. So that is to say a few days ago. So real IPs, actual IPs that are being attacking, that are attacking a machine. And because, well, I thought that perhaps this was not enough. And for you to have a clear understanding as to how it works, I have a machine open. Well, it is not easy to, to read, but well, at least you can see. You can see it, and these are attacks that are being committed today, January, uh, sorry, 4th of December, Sunday. It's doing nothing. This is an IP address, 163, finishing 160, where there is a strange name for that IP. It is trying to access with the username 111 with the password SXX, and notice what I told you before. This is a user password, so it shows here, user1234, password, probably they are looking for username1234, and probably the password is also1234. It is very, very important that when you set up your email account, your website, you name it, never, ever use Passwords as easy as these ones. Some people go and say, well, mine is more difficult, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Don't do that, please. So, what we are seeing right now maybe a temporary attack. No, it is not. You notice that uh, right, so since yesterday, I've been seeing these IPs, uh, which are often the ones from which attacks are committed. So there is an IP that is trying to access at any cost through uh, port 22, FTP port, because servers have a minimum level of security, 
whenever there is some intrusion attempts on part of an IP, then the IP gets uh, access denial, denied. If this were not the case, we could say that that company hasn't got enough uh, security implemented. But now let's see other types of attacks, not only uh, through FTP. So this is an attack to an email server. Again, we have a number of IPs trying to gain access to it, to get to it. Actually, there are some list of uh, some servers that have a list of IPs that are on a blacklist. That is to say, they those IPs are blocked by default. Many email servers uh, recognize that or, or, or detect that IP is on a blacklist, and therefore uh, IP is automatically stopped. So spam house servers do that, stop those IPs that are blacklisted. And now I'd like to play a clip. I'm sure that you've seen the clip before. It's a video as to uh, how to guess when an IP address comes from. So this is, so there are websites such as Whois. So if someone attacks your equipment, if you just enter the IP address, an IP address that appears in the logs of any management program that you may have in place for uh, email or FTP, you can easily get at that IP. Nearly all the attacks that we get uh, come from China, from Russia, countries with which we have no agreements or where it's very difficult to implement any kind of agreement. So therefore, those IPs will be irreversibly lost and actually will never get to the perpetrator, to the attacker, because the country will not, will not disclose that information to us. And that's why so many attacks are being conducted from China, because Cooperation, justice cooperation between China and our country is just minimum cooperation. And now, Ruth, is all yours. So we move on with our recipe. Where were we? Eight. We had eight already. Discovery, secrets, disclosure, penalty from six months to two years. The company, oh my God. Last week I got a call. I was called direct and they said, oh, we saw you on this talk, so we'd like you to come over here and then to frighten our 140 developers. And I said, well, if you want me to be there, I will be there. Why is that? Well, if you are an employee of, you work for HP, IBM, or a small uh, or medium-sized company, you have access to third-party data. You as an IB employee, or you name it, or any other company, you will be held accountable legally. However, this would also impact the company that you work for. So therefore, you have to frighten. Employees have to be frightened, have to be warned, have to be trained and be very well aware that the impact can also be uh, an impact on the company. And then companies may not be very happy about it. Setting up a business takes a long time and lots of effort, so companies do not really want to have this uh, type of employees. So this is more of the same. Okay, so I skip that. So damage crime causing damage and harm to th third parties. Once I'm in, I steal data, I tamper with, I encrypt it, I make data unavailable. So now sentence is from three uh, to from six months to three years. Then we would negotiate with the public prosecutor. It is the first time that this crime has been committed. If I know something, if I've reported to the police or to the law enforcement 
Law enforcement agencies have specialists in technology. They are highly specialized. They are very good teams. And what is the investigation process like? You've been attacked, you report the incident, then you get the help of the police, and then you gather the evidence once you have all the evidence. So they may decide to wait what happens with that person, how this person is moving, then be up until all the evidence is gathered, put in packets and packaged and reported to law enforcement agencies. Well, sometimes the law enforcement agencies may come to your company and, for instance, the program Volatility is used to dump all that information, to gather evidence, and then they also scan or go after the IPs from which those connections and attacks are being carried out. If it is very severe, the case is handled from by the scientific police or forensic police, and if and sometimes the police take the equipment with them. Well, sometimes uh, they want to work with the machine off and sometimes with the machine on for a specific cases. I can remember Lorenzo Martinez. I don't know whether you know him. He is uh, uh, he works in forensics and then he said, OK, send it out the mobile phone. Do not switch it on charge the full battery, otherwise I would not be able to take out all the information. So therefore, we have to bear this in mind. And then how is the legal mechanism activated? So reports uh, by a legal representative at uh, the police uh, department. So I just, the we are not talking about a homicide. We are not talking crime scene. So. Cyber crime is li alive. What has happened just right now, if the offend attacker doesn't know that you are there, if you wait for him, if you give him time, the more silent the victim, the more mistakes the attacker makes, and the more evidence that I have. From the legal viewpoint, the work that we carry out or done is different. We just wait. We continue scanning, we package it, and we give uh, ourselves some time, sometimes days, sometimes weeks, sometimes months to fully understand what is happening. If someone playing in the network, or perhaps it's not you, but someone who is following us on video streaming, someone goes in there by accident or has discovered uh, something, Well, here we don't have very many bounty bugs programs. So as far as I know, they are not uh, popular or they are not available here in Spain. We don't have bug bounties. But if you find something, if you find something that you want to report, contact search. We know nothing about one and zeros. We cannot disclose the name of our comp client. We are protected by professional secrecy or privilege. That's our profession. We are like priests. So before I came here, I thought about a priest in the north of Spain, Pope. And he says, if God put this in here, that's for us to use it. He's an engineer. He also takes part in, participates in hackathons, and he's a great professional. So he gave me food for thought, okay, what he said. Everything is there to learn from it, to enjoy it, to share it. But there is a limit. There is a limit to everything. And I believe that you can't report any incidents to any of these parties. If you want to report it in an anonymous manner, okay, you contact CERT and then you choose uh, where you want to be, on what side you want to be. If you want to be uh, the good one, you really need to know what has happened. It is like when you are a teenager. You, When you are a teenager, you try out, and then when you grow up, when you get older, you just make a choice. Well, and this is exactly the same thing here. I would like to personally thank Frank 
I have to say this in public. I admire him. He is a brain embodied in the body. He is so good that the guys of the White Rabbit have hired him for him to uh, ride on the block spot. So if you have a good eyesight, you may see the logotype and also that of the Honeycon. That is also a very good uh, eye security a company in Guadalajara. Those of you who want to know more about this world of uh, cyber security um, technology law, look them up on the internet. Follow the white rabbit. So you will enter into a wonderful, different uh, world, and surely you will, they will never disappoint you. And this is all from me. Are there any questions? Any questions? It is time for questions. Trade-offs later on outside. Oh, confessions, sorry. Confessions later on. Questions? Hello, good afternoon already. First of all, thank you to the two of you for your presentation. It has been really interesting, and especially Ruth. She's one of these wild, crazy uh, lawyers that goes into ones and zeros, and one of those as well. Therefore, I believe that, as you told us, penal code is complete, it is open, so the only thing they need to include is the key logger for it to be more comprehensive, and, but there is a problem. The problem that we face is that there is a shortage of means. Is it everything is included in the rules, in the standards, however, research is not, doesn't have the capacity to uh, get to the uh, villains, to get them, to catch them. Yes, they cannot cope with it. OK, please become uh, policemen, become researchers. They have their hands full. Yes, I can afford to have a client. And for me to file a report, you know, I may be handling a case for six months or seven months. We do 24 hours monitoring. We are all the time scanning, looking for information, traces. We are just, uh, we want the criminal to get anxious because the victim is standing still, is not doing nothing. I can afford to do it. However, uh, uh, judges and other professionals cannot do that because they are short-handed. They just don't have resources. They don't have capabilities. Please become policemen, become researchers. We need you. And actually, our legal system, our penal system, criminal system is quite restrictive and safeguards, safeguards uh, privacy to a large extent. National police forces or Guardia Civil may ask for uh, permission for search warrants or for telephone tapping. And then the judge tells them, right, you have this uh, amount of time to do it, this length of time to do it. And sometimes they just do not have the material time to gather all the evidence that they need. And other times, whenever the case uh, wants to, well, reaches uh, national police forces or our hands, uh, or us as uh, forensics uh, experts, the evidence sometimes is volatile. It, Sometimes evidence disappears. And then, having said that, we have to say that the evil always go ahead of the legal system. And we are behind the evil. So there are three elements, three elements. And from my experience, I said that these three elements, no matter how fast we want to produce legislation, to make uh, legislation and policies, we have a legal system which safeguards privacy a lot. Then the uh, evidence is volatile, and then the legal experts, uh, professionals are short-handed. And then, well, the criminal prosecution system has improved a lot, has advanced a lot, and likely continues to safeguard the rights of the person, no matter how much of a criminal that person is. Uh, rights are safeguarded. Hello, two questions or two comments. First of all, I heard that in Germany, scanning ports is considered footprinting. 
Apparently, as far as I know, it is illegal. I don't know whether you know it or not. Is it considered fingerprinting here or is it for printing? What happens here? And second, short ago in the US, apparently, well, it's not legal for judges to issue a search warrant to uh, research a computer, no matter whether it is located, even if it is located on China, in China. So does that mean that DNS is authorized to do espionage? Well, you know that according to our clinical prosecution law, having a tool that would allow you to do an intr intr intrusion, calling the next, so having that tool makes it already a wrongdoing, makes it already a criminal act. Eloy Velasco, a person who is uh, well known by uh, many of us, he, uh, the, the other day he mentioned that having the mere fact of uh, owning those tools, having those tools is already crime. And then as Manu said, how many people are uh, engaged into a criminal case for that or is in prison because of that. No one. Well, the provision is there because there is no material way to channel all the types of crimes. Well, what I do is just, I forbid it all. And then I take it from there and then I do whatever I want to do. And then, well, you may argue whether, I don't know, whether kitchen knife, okay, well, if you stab someone with it, okay, that's a criminal tool, but if you use it to cut food, it's not. For something to become a crime, at the end of the day, uh, the use of a tool is what makes it a crime or not, or criminal weapon or not. So from what the U.S., what I like is like, okay, so back at you. So say, I'm going to research a computer that you have in Kansas and say, careful, take it easy. So they wouldn't like it, would it? So I leave it there. Uh, this is food for thought. Think about it. So the American so so here I am, give it all to me, okay? Uh, well, let us do it the other way around and you tell me whether you like it or not. Are we done? 50 seconds. Well, a quick question, please. Quick question. Hello, thank you very much to the two of you for your presentation. So in Spain, port scanning, to what extent is it legal? Well, unless you don't break anything and unless no one hears about it, so don't say it, don't disclose it. No, well, but at the low level, what does the law say? Well, scanning a website, I don't think it is illegal. If it is a router, a firewall telling me that that information is there, I'm not breaking the firewall. Actually, to access a website, you have to go through port 80. If it is a secure port, you go through it, and that port of 443, that is uh, open, so it is open. You are not doing nothing wrong. That's my understanding. Yes, that's my understanding as well. So call me, call me, or you send out an anonymous tweet to me. All right, thank you very much to you too. It's been a pleasure being here. Oh, okay, thank you for being here on a Sunday morning.